Bueno, vamos a continuar con nuestra sesión dedicada a la, a la investigación en, en el, en, al, al género y a la investigación en el sector TIC. Y ahora contamos con una conferencia de una de las eh, personas expertas realmente en esta problemática desde hace mucho tiempo. Yo tengo que decir que he leído sus investigaciones y sus libros y para mí ha sido una fuente de de inspiración. Eh, hoy tenemos la satisfacción de contar con Nick Jagger, que es Senior Researcher en el Institute for Employment and Studies en la Universidad de Sussex en, en Inglaterra. Eh, yo creo que esta conferencia nos va a aportar eh, una visión que nos ayudará a completar también nuestra, nuestra investigación. Um, cuando quieras. ¿no? Okay. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today is based on two studies I, I've worked on. The first one was a <coughs> 2001 report for the, the Department of Trade and Industry, um, we, we, where we looked at um, women in ITEC courses and careers. Um, but because it was in 2001, I've produced some updated data because it's a, you know, we might as well have it a bit more up to date. The other report is, is, was produced this year uh, for the European Commission, and it's, it's a, a report on benchmarking policy measures for gender equality in science, but I thought it would be useful to look at the, the, the parallels between gender equality in science and gender equality in ICT. Okay. When, when we, we started the report for the Department of Trade and Industry in 2000, the, the, you know, the, the, there was a lot of concern about the number of people who could <coughs> produce ICT and, and, and there was issues around skills supply and there's wages were going up because of skill shortage and whenever wages start going up, government starts thinking we should try and make more, more people to bring wages down. Um, but, and one of the strategies they, they thought they could use was to, to, to have increased numbers by increasing the number of women working in, in the sector. So we, we examined the gender breakdown for courses for uh, computing. Uh, we lo looked at um, the gender breakdown of ICT occupations and ICT sectors. I should say that the study was actually slightly broad, it was a broader definition of ICT than I'll use later. We were looking at information technology and electronics and telecommunications, which is a, a mouthful, but it was what we were looking at. What we, what we were set out to do was to produce some international comparisons to look at the UK compared to the US, Canada, Ireland, Taiwan, and Spain is useful for this purposes today. Um, the main recommendation for the study um, was that we suggested IT, IT clubs for girls, where girls have a separate space to use computers at school, because we felt that the only way we could increase the proportion of women in ICT was to increase the proportion of women studying ICT, because that was a, a prerequisite to actually work in ICT, often to have studied it and know about it. Uh, it, it is. So, this is the, the, one of the core findings we found based in, it's based the data essentially from 1999 for, or slightly earlier, 1998. Um, it was difficult getting comparable data at the time. But this showed that the UK had about 28% women in, in ITEC employment, uh, slightly more than Spain, but only slightly more, while uh, the USA, Canada, and Ireland had higher. And the, most, the interesting one that surprised us at the time was that uh, in Taiwan, over 50% of ITEC employment was female. This may be a definitional thing, but we don't think it was. Okay, I'm just going to update the UK data to start with. Since the 2001 report, um, we've seen an end to the dot-com boom, and an end to some of the concerns about IT skills supply. Um, 
we've also seen a decline in the proportion and number of entrants, proportion of female entrants and, and, and the, the total number of fem female entrants to UK first degree courses by UK residents. Because we actually got, if you count all the people coming from abroad to study IT in England and the UK, things are different. But we try to keep things simple. Um, but on the positive side, in 2004, the, the national, in the whole of the UK, the government introduced uh, uh, computer clubs for girls following a, a regional pilot in the southeast of England. Um, okay, so if we look at the pattern of UK entrance to IT first degree courses, we can see that the numbers peaked, interestingly, for the data we presented in, in uh, 2001. Uh, they peaked in 1999. Um, and numbers have fallen since then to below the levels in 1996. Though, interestingly, you can just see a slight upswing in 2007, which it would be nice to think, though very unlikely, that it was the computer clubs for girls that started in 2004, which has led to this. Um, there, there's probably other reasons for that slight upswing. Um, the slight upswing in female entry to the IT courses is probably more to do with the slight upswing in the number, of, the proportion of IT occupations which are uh, uh, held by females in the UK. Um, in, in parallel with the, the decline in I, of women <coughs> studying IT, there's been a, a decline in the number of the proportion of IT occupations um, which are female, uh, though again we've seen a slight upswing in 2007. Part of the reason is, is, is actually the numbers overall in the sector have remained essentially static with a very slight increase of, and, and a slight increase in, in, in 2007, so there's more scope for women to enter the sector. Okay, I'm going to try and compare um, IT occupations internationally and update the, the, the comparison we did for 1999. Because we can use um, ISCO 88, which is the International Standard Classification of Occupations, it's the classification used by Eurostat and the UN and other bodies, it allows us to compare over quite a long period of time because ISCO is only changed every 20 years. We're just about to get a new one. Um, so what I've done is looked at the, the, the numbers of uh, people in two ISCO groups, ISCO 213, two, which is computer professionals, and 312, computer associate professionals. Uh, the reason for combining these two groups is sometimes the, 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 the boundary between the two groups changes in different countries. So by putting them together, we get rid of some of the definitional problems associated with <coughs> national statistics. Um, okay, so generally, apart from the UK, where it's, it's not a very large increase, the proportion in IT occupations, and this is IT, which is just computing essentially, um, has fallen internationally. In Spain, from 1996, to 2003, it fell from 23 to 24% really, to 20%. Um, Italy, also a decline, but possibly more significant. Uh, Finland, we, they, they weren't collecting data for the labor force. Eurostat in, in 1996, so I don't have the data. But Finland is often held up as an example of, of a country where, where there's high, high participation by women. And even there, there's only 25 or 26% really of, of women in these occupations. The UK is still you know, comparatively poor, but slightly going up. The, the, the difference between 16.4% <coughs> and 16.9% is pretty close to what is reliable in terms of differences in this, these surveys. So I, I wouldn't read too much into that slight increase. <coughs> Okay, the, moving on to the second study <coughs> we worked on, which was uh, led by um, Lise Rothbrist. Um, 
The study covered the EU 27, six associated countries, um, which is, uh, includes Norway, Iceland, and uh, Switzerland, and the Western Balkan countries, um, with basically the former Yugoslavia. Really. Um, it was based on detailed collation of data from Helsinki Group representatives, who are a group of people who are involved in collecting comparable data on women in science across, across Europe. Um, we also, what we looked at was the, the policies that were in place and, and, and tried to compare this to the relative number of women at different levels of the, the set pipeline, the, the leaky pipeline that was referred to earlier. So the, the pipeline from first degrees, first science degrees, uh, by PhDs, professors and uh, researchers in the BES, that's the, the business enterprise <coughs> sector. Sorry, it's a, it's a short end. Okay. Here we have some, some data on, on, on different countries. Um, we compare Spain, Ireland, Italy, Finland and the UK. Um, SMC, which is the first column, is Science, Mathematics and Computing. Another acronym, sorry. And ISCED 5A is the International Standard Classification for Educational Development, which is basically means first degrees. It's simpler to say first degrees, but technically it's ISCED 5A. ISCED 6 are doctorates. Um, and BES, again, is, is Business Enterprise Sector Research. So you can see, um, across the piece, you know, uh, Italy has, has a majority of, of uh, women actually stu studying or obtaining um, science and mathematics and computing first degrees. Um, and still, even at PhD level, Italy has slightly from the majority of women. But interestingly, it has one of the lower proportion of researchers, of female researchers. Um, Spain actually, um, although it's sort of the midway in terms of, of first degree graduates in terms of the proportion of women, actually is one of the highest proportions of women being employed by, as researchers by a business enterprise sector. Um, we'll come on to that because it's quite important for some of the analysis we did later. It's this, this is um, <coughs> in, the, in the actual report that this graph is a straight line, which is perhaps easier, but this was a, an earlier version which I had in a PowerPoint, and so it was easier to use the earlier version. Um, redoing the graph is difficult. Um, the vertical axis, this one, is the total <coughs> expenditure on R&D in the country divided by the number of uh, full-time equivalent researchers. And it's effectively a measure of how much R&D workers in the in, 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 are paid. Because if, if you, virtually all the expenditure on R&D is the salary of R&D workers. Um, <coughs> and so th 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 this is a, a, a measure of, of the, the, the amount of money that is paid, paid to people working as researchers. Um, and the horizontal axis, axis is the, 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 the percentage of full-time equivalent R&D workers who are female. Um, and what, what is... No. There is quite a strong relationship in, uh, between the two, but actually it's negative in the sense that the countries with the highest proportion of women down here, of uh, 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 female R&D workers, also the, se the same countries that are paying their women or their, their R&D workers the, le the, the, the least, while countries who pay their R&D workers the most have, have the, the smaller number, the smaller proportion of the R&D workforce are female. There are some interesting outliers out here, which we'll come to later, who manage to have relatively high 
proportions of their R&D workforce that are female, but also pay them quite well. And, and actually, that's where a lot of the, the ana analytic interest was focused on, trying to understand this relationship. Um, what we found in terms of policies, that policies were often bundled. Um, if you had targets for the number of women, or the proportion of women in, 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 in R&D, you also tended to have an equalities plan. These things seem to go together. Um, women in science units seem to be associated with funding for women in science. And in a sense, it's understandable. If you've got funding for women in, in, in science, you need somebody, you know, an organisation to hand that money out. Um, and so you, you tend to have units associated with uh, women in science when you have... Uh, um, mentoring schemes were, were found in countries that also had university equality plans and, and seemed to, you know, I don't, we, when, because we only had cross-sectional data, we can't say which country, you know, what came first and, you know, you know, whether the mentoring scheme led to university equality plans or university equality plans led to mentoring schemes. But we hope in the future for that sort of data to be collected and we can actually have a clearer idea of how policy development uh, occurs in, in various countries. Um, but interestingly, um, the, the policies were much more likely in countries with um, higher proportions of women professors, and, and that, that's perhaps the, the dominant um, driver of policies. Okay. The proportion, the proportion of women as business enterprise researchers or, or, or researchers generally appeared not to be due to policies because countries with the lowest proportion of women as researchers had the most policies towards women. So in some ways, you know, you can see that if things are going bad for women in, our, in science, you throw a few policies at them, and they're, 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 everything will be happy. Um, it, it, it doesn't seem to actually be terribly effective, um, having policies in that sense. Um, what we, we looked at was what drove this, you know, the, the size of the, um, the proportion of women researchers. And what we found was the larger the, the, the business enterprise sector was in terms of R&D in a country compared to total R&D effort in terms of employment. Um, the, the, the smaller the, the proportion of women overall. Uh, basically, if your country, if the country has a high proportion of, of the R&D effort in universities and in, in the government sector, uh, you tend to have a higher proportion of women researchers. But if you have a higher proportion of overall R&D activity in the business sector, you tend to have a smaller proportion of women researchers. Um, the, the interesting thing, going back to this graph, <coughs> okay, is these outliers up here. These tend to be driven by countries which had better higher proportions of women working in the economy in general and, and, and sort of social and cultural mechanisms to enable women to work, uh, higher levels of childcare, better general uh, flexibility of employment practices so people could work more generally. Uh, did we rush back forward? Nope, we don't. <laughs> we rushed a bit too far forward. <coughs> okay. So, ultimately, what this suggests is, is you know, we, we, the, the, the issue in terms of it improving the situation of women um, in R&D and in IT, are, are, and we need to address the demand side. We need to address... address the business employer policies and their practices. Um, you know, 
the pipeline is quite efficient at getting people moving up the pipeline. You know, we, it is leaky. These people go somewhere. Um, but what happens is, 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 is the demand is not there from the employers. And we need to really, um, we, we've had years of, of supply side policies because actually this is something that governments can feel they can actually do and address much more easily. They, 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 they engage in, in supply side issues. Actually, if we want to change the situation of women in, in RMZ and in IT, we probably need to address demand side issues. And that is the end of my session. <laughs>